Hey, remember this? If so, you probably were a newbie Dark Souls 1 player around the time of its release. Back then, many new players were desperate to find some kind of advantage against that early game difficulty, and online there was talk everywhere of a secret early game weapon with high damage acquired by sniping off the tail of the Red Kite Drake using a bow and arrow. With stat requirements that weren't even that high and 200 damage off the bat, this was a no-brainer for many struggling newcomers, myself included. But as time's gone by, this weapon has been referred to as the Noob Trap for two reasons. First, and most importantly, there is no scaling to this weapon, so leveling up stats won't increase its damage. Secondly, although it can be upgraded, the parts to upgrade it are pretty rare, it costs a lot of souls per upgrade, and the damage increase is pretty minimal. So, were a new player to use this, the damage would seem great initially, but you'd find that dropping off fairly soon, and by the time they reach somewhere like Anor Londo, they may want to switch weapons, only to find that they don't have the stats to do so, perhaps because they spent tens of thousands of souls upgrading this damn thing. I've actually seen in recent times this weapon getting put onto worst weapons in the game lists, and nowadays I don't think anyone really uses it. But today, I want to see what it might be like to try to beat the whole game with this noob trap weapon. The rules of this run are as follows. Rule number one, I can only use the Drake Sword to do damage, with the only exceptions being getting out of the asylum and using arrows to shoot off the Red Kite Drake's tail. Rule number two, I'm not allowed to go down to Ash Lake, I've added this so that I only use the dragon scales I can find above ground or in the painted world. This was on the basis that most new players probably won't find Ash Lake on their first playthrough, so it's going to give me a more authentic new experience. And finally, this last rule is for you. Yes, you, person watching this video. If you really want to get into the spirit of this run, why not play the Drake Sword drinking game while watching this? Simply pour yourself a beverage of your choice and take a swig every time I say the word Drake from now onwards. Don't worry, it'll be fine, it probably won't be that many. With that out of the way, let's get started. Asylum Demon is dealt with normally and we fly off to Lordran. I dash to the Cranky Tosser Merchant and buy the short bow for 1000 souls as well as a whole bunch of arrows. Next, we get to the Red Kite Bridge. We would normally need to kill the Taurus Demon, but I chose Master Key as my gift so we can go beneath Firelink Shrine into Valley of the Drakes, run through to this elevator leading up to Darkroot Garden, run backwards through the Undead Parish, dash through this gate, pass the boar, and down this hole here where we get trapped and murdered by rats while the Hollow Soldier floats above us laughing. Getting past all the enemies via this narrow ledge is pretty annoying, so the best strategy is to get a shield, turtle in this corner, and slowly edge round as they attack you until they fall off. I'd like to credit my guy American Badass 1219 with this strategy. I kick this guy off the ledge and run to kick down the ladder to unlock the bonfire under the bridge. I'm not 100% sure the Drake is on the bridge yet, so let's go trigger it up. Nope, it's there, it's there, ready and waiting. I remove this chap and now we've got our ideal spot lined up. Time to shoot some arrows. What the f- So, settle in for a lot of shooting. After about 20 successful hits, the Drake's tail comes off and we have the only weapon we'll ever need. I haven't used the Drake Sword in, no joke, about 10 years now, so this is kind of a weird sense of nostalgia for me. I chose the Knight class at the beginning of the game, so we have enough strength and dex to two-hand the Drake Sword right off the bat. The sword actually provides an extra little bonus of increasing our magic and flame defense while we wield it. It's nothing game-draking, but could be useful in some situations. So, the damage from this will be seemingly great right now, one-shotting enemies when before it probably took two to three hits, maybe more. For the Taurus Demon, I opted not to plunge and to lure him up here for a full-on fight. I did make the one mistake and got hit, but other than that, our trusty Red Kite Tailblade absolutely tore us him apart. After celebrating with a Hollow Soldier trick shot, we check with Andre to see how much it would drink to upgrade the sword. One Dragon Scale and 10,000 of our finest souls. That's a pretty tall ask for now, but we'll come back to it. Let's test out our blade on this Berenike Knight. Most new players might have got smashed by this guy previously, but we bring it down in three hits. It's an absolute piece of Drake. Now, being a dragon weapon, we also have a weapon skill we can take advantage of, and it's especially useful here. By using the R2 while we two-hand, it fires a shockwave which shoots forwards across the floor, draking out anything in its path. When you have a choke point like this, it's ideal for getting some enemies together in a line and wiping them out. It does drain our durability, so best not to spam it and save it for the right moment instead. 
I tried it on Lautrec, but the damage wasn't great. That's not a good sign that's happening already. But I used a few more R2s, plus some normal swipes with it, and I sent Lautrec to the Underdraker. He drops the all-important Ring of Favor and Protection to boost our health, weight load, and stamina, which we'll wear for the rest of this run. So let's see how we do with the Belfry Gargoyles. What's our damage? Nope, still pretty good. The first one dies in 7 hits, and the second dies in 4. I drake my way up this ladder, and the first bell is rung. I went to mess about with the Titanite Demon just for the drake of it, but its AI seemed to melt down before my eyes from the awesome power of our noob weapon, so it just stood there while we beat it to death. Weird. I then decided to head down to fight this thing, sticking close to the water of course because it's important to hydrate. I wanted to see if I could get some kind of marginal power boost sorted now by getting the drake scale from killing the hydra, but as always, this was pretty painful. Trying to destroy that last head causes me a lot of aggro. Eventually, Hydra goes down and we've got our first dragon scale. After farming a few souls, I go to Andrake and upgrade our sword to plus one, meaning it now has 220 damage instead of 200. Yay, I guess. The Moonlight Butterfly drakes down and we have the same pretty boring fight as always. I had some faint hope that the R2 attack could hit it from a distance, but of course that's not the case. After two rounds of the butterfly landing, victory is ours. I headed back down to the Drake Root Basin and decided to test out our blade against this Black Knight. It did surprisingly well actually. We took down the knight with little to no issue. We venture further down to Valley of Drakes and go to fight this Drakeaying Dragon. Our damage still doesn't seem too bad, but we are getting to the point where enemies will start to have much more health and our damage isn't really going to change much from here on out. It took a little while, but with this we have our second Dragon Scale. Down in Blight Town, Souls were farmed until we had 10,000, and our Drake Sword is now plus 2, giving us another 20 whole points of damage. Just got to Drake it till we make it. Behind the bonfire here is another Dragon Scale, but we can't do much yet as we need two Dragon Scales now to level up the weapon further. While trying to convince Mildred to Drake the Elevator up here to her demise, I messed up and somehow chained it into the most epic plunging attack you've ever seen. Quaylag is our next opponent, and we can see the damage to our health bar is definitely much less than previous bosses. Still, it's not awful, and the usual rules apply. Keep away from her body when she starts to drake as it means she's about to do the AoE. I was able to do this first try, despite one mistake at the end, and now we can ring the second bell. I pump some more points in strength and dex, <laughs> nah just kidding, it's vitality and endurance, all day every day, and then head out of Blight Town. And now we do the Capra Demon. I have to say, it felt very satisfying to easily one-shot all these mobs on the way down. Capra itself was pretty fine. I took out the dogs with one shot each, and then Capra was downed with a couple of my Earth Drake special attacks, and then a few normal slashes. Very smooth, even without any high poise armor. The special attack is kinda trash though. It doesn't really give much additional damage, so I don't think it's worth sacrificing durability, at least against bosses. I interrupt this butcher who I believe was slicing up a fillet Drake, and then execute a wonderful plunging attack on this giant rat. That's going to give it a splitting head drake for sure. I light up the bonfire in the depths, and then take out some rats, and give this channeler the shortest plunging attack ever. Time for the gaping dragon. How much damage are we talking? Oh, that's pretty nice actually. Look at his little head drake around there. Weirdly though, I couldn't seem to cut its tail, even after hitting it loads. Not that I need it of course, but still. With a few more hits during the dragon's enormous openings, down it goes. Just for those keeping score, I've actually not yet died to a boss. My plan now was to clear off all possible bosses before heading to Sens, so I buy the crest of Ardorius, running down to our next underdraking, Great Grey Wolf Sif. The damage is significantly less than the Gaping Dragon, which is weird because you'd think an armoured scale dragon would be able to resist damage better than a flesh and fur wolf, but hey, video game logic, am I right? The fight itself is pretty elementary, just keep to the back legs and swing away. It takes a bit longer than usual, but it's nothing we can't handle here. With one final limp, Sif goes down. Time for some air travel. While flying there, we filmed a hit comedy movie starring Samuel L. Jackson that we named Drake's on a Plane and then arrived at the asylum. Now, coming back here is already giving me some terrible PTSD from the throwing knife run, a feeling that I really struggle to Drake to be honest, but I've just got to push through and do the stray demon. The damage here is a little better than against Sif, but not by much. Stray Demon is very predictable though, 
so it's an easy fight, but it's very slow. On the other hand, compared to spending 20 minutes waiting for Poison to kill it, this was an absolute dream. I grabbed the small doll and flew back to Lordran to at last continue our journey. I headed to Sens, and the damage against these Drake men is not good. It took six hits to bring one of them down. As always, this place was a delight to the senses. Damage to the forearm serpent was better, but still low. I love the way he goes from standing firmly in midair to flopping down over the edge. You ever notice how there's four swinging blades here and then another four blades up here? Guess that's why it's called a fortress. Anyway, we wait for the giant to start throwing the ball and then we drake a break for this bonfire and then light it up. The giant at the top took about 12 hits to bring down, which doesn't make me feel too confident about Iron Golem given his high defense against physical attacks. Well, let's see what we're dealing with. 67 damage. Yikes. I mean, at least it's better than the throwing knives, but that's a really low bar to compare it to. I managed to hit his ankles enough to make him all drakey, but couldn't follow up with enough damage for the topple. Gotta love this grab though. Good thing Dark Souls 1 has perfect hitboxes. I can already hear the Dark Souls 2 crew in the comments cheering for that joke. Anyhow, I survived, and after more patient yet weak hits, the golem is defeated. For maybe the fourth time this run, I get grabbed and carried away somewhere against my will, and then level up using the souls I just gained. After a very lucky escape in the rafters, I got draken inside the painted world thanks to the small doll we grabbed earlier. The most important thing here is killing the second undead dragon to get the final dragon scale that we'll be using on this run. This dragon took absolutely ages to kill, so yeah, our damage has definitely dropped off. Eventually it dies, and we go to upgrade our drake sword to plus three. End game weapon complete. We go to test our new weapon on Priscilla. Luckily, we counter her invisibility by seeing her footprints in the snow drakes on the floor. Our damage doesn't look to be that much better, and she's not even a boss with particularly high health. I used the weapon art for the finish, and yeah, that damage is still not worth the durability loss. Let's head back to Anor Londo. In keeping with the theme, I made sure to give myself the traditional Anor Londo noob experience. Ah, the nostalgia. I thought for a brief moment the weapon art could come in handy here, but instead the Silver Knight just decided to drake his own life. Now, on to probably our first big challenge boss-wise, Ornstein and Smo. For some reason, this fight was especially janky today. Ornstein had some kind of seizure over there in the corner, and Smo ran over the broken pillar, which I've never seen happen. Anyway, what's our damage like? 103 damage to Ornstein, compared to 234 damage to Smo, Quite the difference. I do normally kill Smo first these days, but given the damage absorptions here, I feel like fighting Super Smo will be a little bit less tedious. I mean, obviously both will be way less tedious than waiting 25 minutes for Poison to kill them off, but still. It's also keeping with the new playthrough theme, as I always used to kill Ornstein first back in the day. I didn't want to rush things with so much at Drake, so I took my time, getting hits in on Ornstein when I could, until he went down. I very nearly died right off the bat in phase 2, not quite sure how I managed to avoid the butt slam, but after recovering, I can see from our damage that this was for sure the best choice for second phase. The trick with Super Smo is you don't want to stay too far away, as otherwise he spams the charge attack, but you also don't want to be too close, as otherwise he'll do the butt slam, and you won't have enough time to get away. But Thanks to Smo's significantly lower damage absorption, this doesn't last too long, and one final crotch slash makes this thick boy explode like a super Smover. After acquiring the Lord Vessel from the Goddess of Demonetization, we return to Firelink, and Peter Frampton is able to show me the way while I say to him, I'm in you. I place the Lord Vessel, and decide to head down to this God for Draken place, the Catacombs. Here, we can fight everyone's favourite necromancer, and the only minor challenge is to pin down the wheel one amongst all the drakes. After less time than it takes me to make a sandwich, Pinwheel gets blown away and thankfully drops my favourite of the three masks. We book it up into Tomb of the Giants, where I quickly make it to the first bonfire with no issue. I also completely forgot to rest at any catacombs bonfire, so I had to make it all the way back down, but at least I got to use the weapon art to do this. I also got the Skull Lantern on the way, which was useful as I had no light source. I beelined through to get the second bonfire lit, and now it was time for Nito. For the first time in this run, I actually died to a boss. Nito got me with his grab attack right by this wall, and I got stuck in this weird position that I couldn't seem to get out of on top of this stalagmite. 
I still nearly won, but I was too vulnerable here to his attacks. For my second attempt, I decided to Havel tank to drink my life easier. This took a lot of hits, especially because we had to keep taking out the skeletons, but I kept at it, healing where needed and trying like hell to avoid that grab. Nito goes down after god knows how many hits, and our first Lord Soul is complete. So it's now time for the best area in the whole game, Lost Isolith. Ceaseless Discharge chases us down because he hates noobs or something, but promptly leaps and then suffers the shame of being bested by a new weapon. He should have hit the drakes before making that jump, maybe he'd still be here. I actually found a totally safe spot to slash up this worm, which I never noticed before which was handy, and then went to take on the stray demon, Drake 2. Not much of note here apart from I found doing a close range special attack actually does a decent amount of damage, but still think I'd prefer not to mess with the durability, so I'm not going to par Drake in that much. This is uneventful as always, and we defeat Demon Fire Oregano, or Demon Fire Oregano to you American folks, or Oregano Fuoco Demoniaco to any Italians in the audience. Next up, it's too many legs, too many, many legs. This is faster than the Demon Fire Marjoram, but only because Centipiedi has quite a bit less health. I even got the tail cut and killed the thing mid-fight for the orange charred ring. Centipiedi doesn't have a leg to stand on anymore, and he drakes the L after a fairly short fight. Is there any point in me even covering this boss? Like, Bed of Chaos would be exactly the same whether I was doing it with a weapon or just bare fists or any other build. Probably more noteworthy is the Pyromancer NPC out here just getting absolutely draped. But other than that, Bed of Chaos gets the same treatment as always, and we get the hell out of here. Quickly pivoting to New Londo, I decided a good test would be to actually take out all these ghosts in here. I like the way the special attack makes this one slowly tumble over, so we take them all out. Good thing that Dark Souls 1 doesn't spam loads of enemies into a small area like Dark Souls 2 and Elden Ring, otherwise this might have been annoying. The water level gets lowered, and we can now attempt the Four Kings. I'm definitely Havel tanking this one. I'm going to guess we definitely won't be able to kill a king fast enough before another one spawns. Yep, judging by that damage I'd say that's a solid drake on the situation. Killing one king requires a lot of hits. I mean, we're not really in any danger due to our enormous HP bar and Havel armor, but still, it's long. I just keep plowing away at one until it disappears, and then move on to the next rinse and repeat. They dead, and we have just one Lord Soul remaining. If there was one lot of enemies I knew were going to handle our damage well, it was these crystal guys. Just 47 damage a hit. Yeesh. This golem also was quite resistant, but luckily his attacks are slow as molasses, so we got that sweet Draken pendant. The crystal general I also thought was going to resist us, but actually he took way more damage than the previous enemies for some reason. So anyway, we escape from prison, get a big very unwanted hug, and then mission down to fight Seath the Scaleless. Seath also has a lot of health and a decent damage resist, but his biggest weakness is turning round slowly as long as I run for this right tentacle. Just keep chasing after this means he has almost no chance. Maybe I should have draken this one more seriously, but he's honestly so easy with any melee build. All four Lord Souls are now ours. So that just leaves the DLC, which as we know, stands for Drake Loadable Content. Ian the Sanctuary Guard blocks our way, but this boss has pretty low health compared to the others we've been fighting, so it feels like hits from the Drake Sword do quite a bit of damage here. Okay, so 129 damage isn't lots, but I'll take it. Ian retires from his position, allowing us to enter Ula Seal proper, but the next three bosses have huge damage absorption, so this is going to be fun. Whoa, where the hell did that guy come from? Did he just jump off Calamite's back? He tried to drape me by surprise, it seems. Right, Artorius, how much damage are we talking? Okay, 84 is not good. He can also counter very quickly, so I had to wait for prime time opportunities, like after the charging stab, or walking around while he does his flippy jump sword attack. It was a bit of a battle of patience, as trying to get one too many hits in would spell the end for me. He can also buff himself, but luckily the Drake Sword can do just enough damage to Drake him out of the animation, providing I notice right away when he starts doing it. After a battle of attrition, Artorius is down for good. So that just leaves two DLC bosses. First step is to kill this Mimic to grab the Crest Key, get Flame Grilled by Calamite, and then get Goff to treat us to the best cutscene in the game. Now, what kind of damage are we talking for Calamite? 67. Well, that's officially the worst so far. This is going to be one of those kind of fights. These days, I do find most of Calamite's moves fairly telegraphed. The only real issue is the head swipe attacks, which have some questionable hitboxes at best. 
I also died on first attempt right near the end because I got caught by the calamity attack and then he spammed said head swipe before I could recover. This was pretty frustrating as he was close to death. Would this be the fight that made me reach my draking point? Well, thankfully no as I got him on the next try. This was around an 8 minute fight. I did also try to cut the tail but in the end decided to sack it off and just get him killed. If I was an actual noob and I got to Calamy only doing this amount of damage, this would probably be absolute hell trying to do. I can't imagine Manus is going to be that much better. Oh god, Manus. Even getting to this bonfire is triggering some anguish in me from trying to one-shot him. One thing I forgot to mention in the one-shot video is that for the first few hours of trying Manus, I was actually doing the run back every time before finally deciding that save stating was probably more sensible. After kindling this pixelated wall, I ran down to this torment-filled abyss and dreaded the number I would see upon striking Manus. Thankfully, it was a little better than Kalamit. 93 damage. Manus does have more health, but I think this should be manageable. He is faster and more aggressive than Kalamit, but as long as I don't get greedy with... Much like Kalamit, I got Manus on the second try, again after about 8 minutes. The only tricky part is the second phase, avoiding the Drake beads, but I felt fairly comfortable in getting it done. One thing that seemed to help Whittle Down Challenger handy is that his giant arm seemed to take a bit more damage. A last minute dodge to his jump attack, and we claim victory for our own. Right, let's finish off this noob run. Back down to the Lord Vessel, we place those souls and run down to fight Gwyn. For this, I'm not going to parry because we need to two hand our weapon, so I opted to one last time go back to the Havel Tank noob strat and absorb all Gwyn had coming. Come on, big guy, I can drake it. Damage from us isn't that great, so it took quite a few hits to bring him down. The openings are pretty narrow, so I really took my time with this one, punishing only certain things like the three hit combos or the grab. Luckily, I could mid roll thanks to my high endurance, and we just powered through to down Gwyn and beat Dark Souls 1 using this classic noob weapon. So, how was using this weapon after all this time? Well, in the latter half of the game the damage did drop off, but not as much as I was perhaps expecting, with the one exception being the DLC bosses of course. I think that would have been painful to do as a new player, probably also stuff like Nito and the Four Kings, but it's certainly viable to at least some extent. My last thought on this is... When the drake that we draked in turn draked the other drake, we could drake that most drakes drake within a certain drake while sometimes draking a drake inside the fourth drake souls we encountered, but the drake to consider is the drake beyond the drake which we can in turn drake drake drakeity. I've been Drake A Leads, thanks for watching, and if you enjoy the video, why not consider leaving a like and sub to help support the channel. Whenever we next return to Dark Souls 1, I've got an epic magic challenge in mind, but in the meantime there'll be some other videos across the other FromSoft games. Until then, have a good one and see ya.